So in addition to simple diffusion and osmosis, we have something called facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion is diffusion that is helped out, facilitated, allowed by a protein in the, in the cell membrane. So remember that we have um, one of the possible functions of a membrane protein is transport. This is how it works. So in facilitated diffusion, molecules are still moving down their concentration gradient from high concentration to low concentration. And they, um, but they just can't, for whatever reason, they can't get across the membrane. Maybe they can't, um, they're charged or they're polar, so they can't get through the hydrophobic tails, or they're too big. Um, like a sugar molecule is just too big to fit between the phospholipids. So they need the help of a transport protein. There's two kinds. Um, there's channel proteins, which are those that just literally are proteins that have a big hole right through the middle that molecules can move across. Um, they provide these hydrophilic corridors. That way, anything that's hydrophilic can move through them. Um, and they allow a specific molecular ion to cross the membrane. So here we have a channel protein. This is extracellular outside of the cell. This is the cytoplasm inside. This orange um, solute is in high concentration out here, low concentration in here. So they are going to move down their concentration gradient through the channel protein and into the cell. Um, so that's what they do. They just allow a passageway for these things to cross. Then we have carrier proteins, and these ones are a little bit different. Um, these ones actually change shape and kind of grab something from one side of the membrane and change shape and put it on the other side of the membrane. So they carry it across. For example, this orange solute is moving from its concentration gradient, high concentration to low concentration. So it goes into the middle, the carrier protein grabs onto it, and then opens it up and lets it out the other way. Um, so it's not just a straight open channel, it actually has to move it. But both of these are, um, are still passive transport. They're not requiring any energy to move across. So it's the same as osmosis and diffusion. Um, there's a couple of special kinds of channel proteins called aquaporins, and these are channel proteins that allow the diffusion of water. I think we already talked about this. They allow for 3 billion water molecules a second or a minute, something like that. So that's a lot of water molecules, and they're water specific, so only water can pass through. And water can't pass through on its own because it's charged. It has, um, it's polar, so it can't pass through these hydrophobic tails. It doesn't work. Um, and then there's specific ones, um, specific channels that can be closed sometimes. Because sometimes we don't want to allow these certain ions across or something, or there's only a specific time when we want the ions to cross. So we call them gated channels. We have a gate on them, so sometimes they can't pass, and then sometimes we can open it, so they can pass. And there are, doesn't say it. There are um, a couple kinds of stimuli, signals that allow these channels to open. Sometimes the presence of a molecule will allow the um, the ion channel to open, or sometimes like an electrical signal. We talk about nerve cells. Nerve cells require an electrical signal to open these ion channels, which is what allows a message to be sent down a nerve cell. Um, so this again is carrier proteins. Carrier proteins undergo a subtle change in shape that translocates, moves, the solute binding site across the membrane. So the solute binding site is open to this side of the membrane, and then they undergo a change in structure, and now the solute binding site is open to this side of the membrane. So they're just basically picking something up and moving it across and not requiring any energy. Um, and some diseases can be caused by malfunctions in this, as you might expect. Um, so then we get into active transport. So the other ones, we did not need any energy. No energy was being put in. And now we move into active transport. These guys need energy. Because the main difference is rather than things diffusing down their concentration gradient from high concentration to low concentration, with active transport, we are pushing things up their concentration gradient. This would be as if all you students were spread out across the whole classroom, and I just said, I just push all of you over to one side of the classroom. All your chairs, all of you. No one would want to do that. You guys don't want to be that close to each other. It would require a lot of energy. Not random. I would have to put in a lot of energy, a lot of commotion to get you guys all to move to one side of the classroom. Um, so this is different than facilitated diffusion because remember, facilitated diffusion is still moving things down their concentration gradient. But now we're going to change it and go up concentration gradient. 
Um, and we're going to need the help of a protein because this is never going to happen on its own because we need to put in energy. So, like I said, active transport requires energy and moves substances against their concentration gradient. The energy that we usually use is ATP. Remember, ATP releasing a phosphate and becoming ADP is an exergonic reaction. And so if we couple that with an endergonic reaction, the new endergonic reaction can absorb the energy, the free energy released by ATP. Um, and like I said, it's very specific proteins that perform this active transport. Um, and a lot of times we want to have specific ion concentrations or solute concentrations that are different than our surroundings. Um, because for whatever reason, it's important that we have more of the solute inside than outside. And so that's what active transport is good for. Let's say we want to have a really high concentration of hydrogen ions inside of our cells. They would normally leave, right? They would go down their concentration gradient from high concentration to low concentration, but we can pump them back in against their concentration gradient, so it requires energy, but we can maintain that concentration gradient through active transport. And the sodium potassium pump is one type of active transport system. So basically what happens is outside of a cell, we have high sodium and low phosphate. And so it would make sense that sodium would want to come in and phosphate would want to go out. I'm sorry, potassium would want to go out, but we need to maintain this. We need to maintain high sodium outside and high potassium inside. So what we do is there's this carrier protein and it fits three sodiums on the inside. So it picks up three sodiums and fits it into its, into its binding sites. Then we need to put in ATP. We need to put in energy for this because we're going to be moving it from low concentration to high concentration and it doesn't want to do that. So we put in an ATP, it releases its energy, its free energy, and then the protein changes shape and releases the sodium to the other side of the membrane, which is why there's so much more sodium outside than inside. And then what it does, which you can't see, but this picture's in your textbook, is two potassiums come in. And remember, potassium is in low concentration outside and high concentration inside. So when we're gonna move it across the membrane, like this, by putting in another ATP, we're again, we're moving potassium from low concentration to high concentration. So we need to put in ATP. This is active transport. And then it'll go back and it'll do it again. And that's how we maintain this concentration gradient of high sodium outside, low or high potassium inside. So here are three types of tr transport. We have simple diffusion. This solute is hydrophobic and it can diffuse right across the membrane. This triangle solute is probably polar or charged and so it can't get across the membrane on its own, but it is in high concentration outside and low concentration inside. So if we provide this channel right here through this channel protein, it can go. The other example of facilitated diffusion is when we have these blue solute molecules there outside and they need to get across, but we use a, we use a carrier protein. It's gonna pick up the blue ones and move them across. They're still going from high concentration to low concentration, so there's no known energy needed. Then we get over here to active transport. We wanna keep lots of squares inside and lots of balls outside, lots of yellow circles. But to do that, we have to move against our concentration gradient. So we need to put in ATP with the help of a protein because things are always going to move from high concentration to low concentration unless we put in energy to make it happen the other way. So then we, um, why this is important is because our cells have these things called membrane potentials. And basically, it's a voltage difference. So voltage meaning charge. So like sodium's positive and potassium, sodium's I already forgot. Sodium's positive. They're both positive. How um, sodium's positive, chlorine's negative, whatever. We have these, it gives our membranes a potential to say like we're more positive inside than we are outside. And there's a reason for that. We need to maintain those charges for our cells to do their jobs, the ones that have that. And so this voltage is created by differences in the distribution of positive and negative ions across a membrane. And so it's really important to keep these that way if the cells want to do their jobs. Um, and then there's two, two combined forces collectively called the electrochemical gradient. So we're going to talk about that a lot. Drive the diffusion of ions across the membrane. And the two parts of this are a chemical force. So that's the ion's concentration gradient. Which side of the cell membrane has more potassium ions on it? That's the concentration gradient. Then there's also the electrical force. The effect of the membrane potential on the ion's movement. So remember, we don't want to have too many positives together, too many negatives together. They like to be spread out. We don't like to have two positives next to each other. 
and just like all the potassiums don't like to be near each other. Um, so there's those two things that combine to make up the electrochemical gradient. And so sometimes we want to maintain this electrochemical gradient. And it's hard work to do that because these ions don't want to be near each other. So we have these pumps called electrogenic pumps, and they maintain the voltage, the electrochemical gradient across the cell membrane. And the sodium potassium pump is a major electrogenic pump of, of animal cells. This is what we just saw in that other slide, where we were moving three sodiums out and two potassiums in. We're maintaining that electrochemical gradient through the help of that protein. And that protein needs energy to do it because we're moving things against their concentration gradient and against their electric gradient. So we need to put in a lot of ATP to do that. The main electrogenic pump of plants, fungi, and bacteria is a proton pump. Remember that a proton pump is an H+, so they maintain their electrochemical gradients the use of protons, whereas we use sodium potassium pumps. Um, and electrogenic pumps help store energy that can be used for cellular work. So these are just maintaining potential energy. By putting all the potassium ions on one side of the cell membrane, we're creating potential energy because those potassium ions want to rush back in. So that's potential energy. So here's an example of the proton pump. These uh, plants, fungi, bacteria, they pump all of their protons outside. So this is the electrochemical gradient. On the inside is a little bit negative, and the outside is a little bit positive. That's the electrochemical gradient, the difference in voltage right there. And it's maintained by this proton pump, which is active transport. It requires the input of ATP. Um, then there's also this thing called co-transport, which is where moving one solute helps move another solute at the same time. Um, so it's coupled, just like when we coupled endergonic with extragonic reactions, meaning it's hap two things are happening at the same time. And plants use this a lot to drive active transport of nutrients into the cell. So they don't have um, a vascular system in the way that we do, and they need another way to get their nutrients into the cell. So what they do is they have a proton pump. They pump all of these hydrogen ions outside of the cell membrane. That requires a lot of energy in the form of ATP because not only are we moving positive, a positive proton to a positive outside, that doesn't want to happen. We're also moving the proton from low concentration to high concentration. So those two forces make this really big electrochemical gradient right here between the inside negative of the cell and the outside positive. So now we've created this force. We've created potential energy because all these protons are outside and they don't want to be. So basically, these protons are going to try their hardest to get away from each other and away from the positive environment that they're in. Luckily, there's this sucrose H plus co-transporter and what it is, is it is a, um, it's a protein that allows H plus to diffuse back across. So H plus can't get across on its own because it's charged and the tails of the uh, phospholipids are non-polar, non so it can't get across, they're hydrophobic. So this co-transporter provides a passageway for that. So this H plus is going to rush across um, through, through diffusion. So it's going to move from high concentration to low concentration. So no energy is required. At the same time, this plant wants sucrose inside of its cell. It needs that for energy. It's a, it's a, um, mono it's a disaccharide, not a monomer, but a dimer, and they need that inside. But it can't get across the membrane. It's too big, and it's going to be moving from low concentration to high concentration. But luckily, this H plus moving across here provides the energy, provides the, um, the activation energy needed to move this sucrose across. So we created this concentration gradient, and now we're going to use it to move this sucrose back across the membrane. So that would be an example of coupled transport, of co-transport. 